Welcome back, everyone, to part three of our series, taking a look at the flu pandemic of 1918-1919. If you did not see the first few episodes of this series, the link is in the description back to episode one, uh, as is the, ex, uh, the link to the original content from Extra History, uh, whose video we are using as our discussion starter uh, for this series. You can see the original for this video if you want to see it without my commentary. I want to let you know uh, for our patrons and our members that episode seven of my series from the Gettysburg Battlefield is going live later today for you. Uh, it'll be live for everybody else sometime tomorrow. Uh, try to give uh, a little bit of a preview at least a day or so in advance for our patrons and our members just as a perk and a way to say thank you. And with that in mind, I want to say thank you to our latest executive producer level uh, patron uh, who has chosen to remain anonymous and I respect that and I want to say thank you to him as well as thank you for the uh, feedback he has offered me uh, on some things on the channel. So I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for that support uh, and it's support like that that makes it possible for me to go to France one week from today. Uh, and if you want to see uh, an example of what you might expect from my trip to France. Uh, I would invite you to check out that series on Gettysburg. There will be a link at the end uh, on the uh, end screen. After you see the screen for the patrons, there'll be links. And one of those links will be to that playlist for the Gettysburg Battlefield. I'm very proud of that. I think it's my best work so far, as far as original content goes. But I fully expect that my videos from France are going to top that. I've got a lot of things planned I've never tried before. I'm, ex I'm excited to bring that to you. But the latest video on Gettysburg, which will be live tomorrow, concerns the aftermath of the Battle of Gettysburg. What was done with the bodies? What was done with the horses? Uh, what happened to all the weapons that were laying around afterwards, things like that. So uh, I want to invite you to check that stuff out. The, the original content, the battlefield content doesn't get nearly the views that these reactions do. I'd very much like to change that. So please be a part of that and turn on your notifications so that when that video does go live for everyone tomorrow, you'll know and you can check it out. But enough about all of that. Let's dive in to episode three of the flu pandemic. One month later. Brakes squeal, steam vents. Dr. Welch and his team are pulling into a train station in Washington, D.C., returning from a grueling cross-country inspection of military hospitals. They hope to make their report and get some rest. Instead, a soldier meets them on the platform with new orders. Proceed immediately to Devon's. Spanish influenza has struck the camp. Eight hours later, Welch and his team arrive in Massachusetts. They find Camp Devins paralyzed. Patients mm. fill each inch of hospital space, turning blue and coughing so hard they tear their abdominal muscles. They hemorrhage blood from their noses and scream in fevered delirium. And you've got to just put yourself in the position, and this is true in any pandemic, of these incredible doctors and nurses and orderlies, these, these people who are putting their own lives on the line to care for these people, knowing that they're exposing themselves uh, to what is happening and uh, risking their own lives, especially when they don't fully understand yet how it spreads. Uh, and, and just the emotional toll that that must have taken on them. Uh, today is my uh, my biological uncle, but we were raised as brothers. Uh, Mike, uh, he would have been 51 today. He passed away uh, in October from complications of COVID. And my sister, uh, who, like me, was raised as a, a sibling to Mike uh, in the same family, uh, was in the room when he passed away. Uh, they were treating him. And she's a, a respiratory therapist at Cleveland Clinic. She wasn't allowed to treat him, but they did allow her to be in the room since that's where she works. Uh, and, and I know that that was very, very difficult for her. On one hand, I'm so glad she was with him, that he had family with him in his last moments. But what she saw and what she experienced and what she continues to see and experience, because she works in the cardiothoracic intensive care unit at the hospital. And so she daily sees people that are dying from a pandemic. Uh, it's got to be so hard. And I have a, a ton of respect for anybody who puts themselves in this position to care for people like this. In extreme cases, the disease has ripped tiny holes in their lungs. 
Oxygen leaks out, collecting beneath the victim's skin, so they crackle when nurses roll them over. Like the pop-snap sound of rice cereal. What is happening? All training has stopped. Recruits that aren't sick have been put into service caring for those that are. Nearly half the camp's medical staff is ill. Some didn't even show symptoms, they just collapsed. These sudden onset patients often die within 12 hours. Mm. Those that avoid that quick death are falling to secondary pneumonia infections. So think about that. I mean, you barely even find out you have it and you're gone. You know, we looked at that death certificate at the beginning of episode one uh, in 1919 when my wife's great grandmother died in this flu pandemic. And it took eight days from when she was first seen by a doctor to when she passed away with this particular point of this uh, disease. And, and the Spanish flu, as we call it, had waves, just like the current pandemic has waves. There were different strains. Some were very, very deadly. Others were not as deadly. Uh, but this particular moment is when it's hitting fast, hitting hard, and killing people, healthy people, really quickly. And that had to have been so scary. The Army has arranged special trains to take away the dead, and it's already showing up in Boston. After a marathon session of autopsies revealing lungs full of frothy blood, the team turns to Welch. He's the head of the American Medical Association and has studied rare diseases on three continents. Shaken, Welch says, this must be some kind of new infection or plague. Then he runs out of the room, stepping around sick men to get to a phone. He calls his boss, Army Surgeon General Gorgas. This is going to spread, he says. The army needs to shut down troop movements and expand hospital space now. Yep. Then he calls the Rockefeller Institute and orders Dr. Oswald Avery to report to Devins. Avery is a peculiar man. Like Welch, he'd shown no interest in marriage or family. Here's the thing. We need peculiar people sometimes. Uh, people who are weird. People who do things that other people don't do people who don't necessarily live like other people did. If you've ever seen the movie Midway, uh, which came out a couple of years ago, the two, 2019 version of Midway, they make light of this a little bit about the guy who's in charge of the cryptology department uh, at Pearl Harbor, uh, who's trying to, brack, er, trying to crack this Japanese code and, and how kind of different he was. Those are the kinds of people we need in moments like this, people who are different. But unlike Welch, who schmoozed at private clubs and vacationed in Atlantic City, Avery had no hobbies or social life. Hmm. He is a single-minded obsessive who lives in an apartment next to the Institute and talks only about his work. Hey, we need if that. If anybody could find the pathogen responsible, Avery could. But they have so little time. Several things need to happen, Welch reasons. They need to figure out how the disease spreads and how to kill it, and whether they could do anything to stop it. They need to identify the pathogen, the bacteria or toxin that caused this disease, so they could develop a serum, antitoxin, or vaccine. And that was Avery's task. Avery, who had done such good work on the pneumonia serum they'd tested in the summer, which might come in handy given all the secondary pneumonia cases. But Welch and his team weren't the only ones hunting for the pathogen. I want to talk about the whole secondary pneumonia thing for a minute because a lot of times when there are pandemics, it's not the disease itself that kills you directly. It's what it causes to have happen in your body. For Mike, uh, my uncle, it wasn't COVID that killed him. It was the fact that COVID uh, causes blood clots, which means they have to put you on blood thinners to prevent you from dying from a blood clot. And in his case, the blood thinners then and all the coughing and all the other strain on his body caused internal bleeding. Uh, and when you have blood thinners, that bleeding is much easier and it doesn't clot as well. And eventually it's that bleeding that actually killed him. Uh, but it still was caused by the pandemic. And the same thing here. Uh, you know, when the AIDS pandemic was happening uh, at its height in the 1980s, uh, people didn't die from AIDS directly. They died because AIDS caused your body not to be able to fight off other things, and then those other things killed you. But it was still the original disease. Long Island, New York. The speeding Board of Health car fishtails down the dirt road. Inside it sits the most unusual pair in American medicine. In the passenger seat, hanging on for dear life, is Dr. William Park. 
Behind the wheel with her foot firmly on the accelerator is the lab's assistant director, Dr. Anna Williams. The two seem almost polar opposites. Where Park is religious, Williams doubts. He's a gentleman born to high society, where she prefers driving fast cars and riding shotgun on stunt planes. But in 25 years of collaboration, they've won fame for their work on polio, rabies, and mm. diphtheria, which is why they're speeding towards an army base. If American doctors hope to produce a vaccine or serum to fight this new disease, they need Park and Williams. No one, not even their rivals at Rockefeller, can produce vaccine in the quantities Park can. If they isolate the pathogen, he can inject it into a horse, then draw the blood and extract the equine antibodies. And Park has a lot of horses. It's how they made enough diphtheria antitoxin to supply every doctor in New York free of charge. So I love the fact that they're pulling out all the resources. They are going to the smart, smartest people, the people who have the background in this. And they're saying, we've got to get on this. And they're getting on top of it. Now that they understand what they're dealing with, now that they know what they're fighting, they're going to find a way to fight it. They park the car, tie on their masks, and get to work. Within hours, they're heading back to the city. The back seat stuffed full of throat swabs, blood samples, and lung tissue. Both teams are looking for the same thing, Bacillus influenzae. 16 years earlier, the German physician Richard Pfeiffer had identified it as the cause of influenza, a discovery so momentous that the microbe was nicknamed Pfeiffer's Bacillus. Isn't it amazing? It's only been 16 years at this point since they discovered what caused influenza. I mean, that's even to, to now. I mean, what, the, what is that, 140 years ago? It's really not that long. But Pfeiffer's is difficult to identify in isolate. Years. A tiny error in preparation can ruin the sample, so finding it takes time. Meanwhile, army epidemiologists are tracking the spread of the disease. They could actually chart it on a map, jumping from base to base along shipping routes and rail lines. Boston, Philadelphia, New York, New Orleans, Puget Sound, the Great Lakes. Sometimes men became so sick in transit that they had to be carried off the ships and trains when they reached their destinations. Mm. Their initial investigation suggests it's severe influenza. That means it's airborne and can survive for hours on hard surfaces. The large number of secondary infections indicate that it suppresses the immune system. Surgeon General Gorgas tries to raise the alarm. He insists his superiors freeze all transfers and stop the troop ships. Now that makes total sense. But you're in a war. Are you going to stop everything? You, you know there's going to be pushback against that idea. At the very least, they could hold the men in quarantine for a week before they board. The military refuses. Germany is on their last legs, they argue. All right, let's talk about the flag for a minute here. So this is the flag of Germany between 1867 and 1918. That's the flag they would have had at the time of the First World War. Black on top, red on the bottom. This is the flag of Yemen today. Red on top, black on bottom. So the flag they keep showing as Germany is actually the flag of Yemen, as many of you pointed out yesterday. And this is not the first time that we've seen the flag get messed up in videos. Uh, if you ever see the oversimplified videos about Adolf Hitler, I believe they showed the Belgian flag at one point as the German flag. So... You know, I, I, I don't want to be too critical because they do an amazing job with their videos, but it seems like that would have been quick research and easy to do. I'm sure they talked about it in their lies episode. The Austrians and the Ottomans are rumored to be drafting peace offers. This is not the time to let up the pressure. Nothing must distract them or the public from the war effort. They send out the next draft registration forcing thousands of men across the country to crowd into civic buildings to fill out paperwork. Gorgas protests. What is the point of this? The camps have stopped all training to deal with the outbreak. So I want to take a minute and show you some of those draft registration cards because those are actually a really common tool that is used in genealogy research to trace your family tree. They've got a lot of very helpful information, so I'll show you an example of one. So this is the World War I draft registration card of my great-great-grandfather. His name was Edward Whitaker. Now, we had always heard a rumor in the family uh, that, so this is my grandmother's grandfather, uh, that uh, he had been nicknamed One-Eye Whitaker. Well, this draft registration card is how I confirmed why he had that nickname. 
Uh, so it tells me a lot of information here. This is, uh, it says that he was uh, living at 631 Olive Street in Niles in Trumbull County, Ohio. He's 45 years old. Yes, 45 year old men had to register for the draft. Uh, he was born June 2nd, 1873. Uh, he's white. He is native born citizen, though his father was born in England. He was uh, born in the U.S. Uh, he is a catcher uh, at the uh, Thomas Works of the Briar Hill Steel Company in Niles. Uh, and he lists his nearest relative as my great-grandfather, Thomas Whitaker, uh, because this is actually just after his wife had died. His wife died earlier in 1918. Uh, she was only in her 40s, and she died of a cerebral hemorrhage. So now his eldest son, Thomas, is his listed next of kin also living at 631 Olive Street. So Edward's actually living with his son is what you can deduce from that. Uh, he signed it right here. So now I've got his signature. Uh, it says Ed Whitaker right there. And then on the back, it tells me that he is of medium height, medium build. He has gray eyes, uh, dark hair. And then it says has person lost arm, leg, hand, eye, or is he obviously physically disqualified? And it says lost left eye. Uh, it's signed by the person who registered him. The date of the registration, which is 12 September 1918. It's stamped for the local draft board. Obviously, they didn't get to the place where they had to draft 45-year-old men. Uh, but that tells you a little bit. And these are available for basically anybody who was born between like 1870, 1871, and 1900. Something like that. Pretty cool stuff. These new draftees wouldn't become fighting men. They just report for duty and get flu. Finally, a win. The army agrees and cancels the next draft. But it's too late. As Gorgas battles the generals, unit commanders are already ignoring medical advice. At Camp Grant, a doctor sits in the commandant's office telling his commander that the overcrowding situation is dangerous. He's ignoring regulations. Too many men in the barracks and on transfer trains. The common what a heck of a time to ignore regulations. Regulations are there for a reason. And in this case, the reason is to keep people from dying as often and spreading a deadly communicable disease. Don's answer will seal his fate. In two weeks, the doctor will be back in this office, telling him that 500 men are dead. The last troop train they'd sent had turned into a plague train. A quarter of the transfers had to be hospitalized and the camp had run out of coffins. Mm. Upon hearing this, the commandant will order the doctor out of his office, draw his pistol, and take his own life. Wow. But that is two weeks from now. At this moment, wow. he says the overcrowding is necessary. This so you can see this guy, this weighed on him a lot. And uh, mm, can't imagine. This is war, doctor. But as bad as things are in the military, they're worse on the civilian front. The head of the public health service is in denial. He issues a useless notice on how to avoid influenza and collects some statistics, but does nothing more. The military worries that raising public awareness of the flu will damage morale. And he's not a man to stand up to the military. And he's not alone. In Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, people are starting to collapse on the street or fall from horseback. Hacking, shivering patients fill hospitals. Employee absenteeism hikes up, but civic leaders refuse to admit the growing crisis. As Park and Williams race to identify the pathogen, with half their staff ill and some dying, the head of the New York Board of Health, a homeopath with no scientific training, mm. denies there's an epidemic. In Philadelphia, the mayor and his health officials are telling the press that the outbreak is nearly over. They continue doing so day after day as the death toll mounts and hospital wards fill. You can see that conflicting information uh, is nothing new. People having the ability to look at the exact same situation and completely spin it as something different and say that something's not happen happening that's obviously happening or something's happening that obviously isn't happening. We think that's a new phenomenon. It's been around as long as people have been around. The press buries flu reports in the back pages to preserve wartime morale. After all, panicked citizens don't show up for work at the shipyard. They don't visit their neighborhood marine recruiter or buy Liberty loans to fund the war effort. Mm. 
And that last one is important because Philadelphia is about to throw the largest Liberty loan drive in the country. Soon, thousands will march through the city and hundreds of thousands will turn up to watch and chip in. Doctors urge the mayor to cancel all public gatherings. He refuses. September 27th, there's been progress. Welch and his team at Camp Devons telephone their report to Gorgas. They've found Pfeiffer's bacillus in a majority of the flu cases. Park and Williams confirm the findings in their samples. Now, if they can isolate and grow a sample of Pfeiffer's, they can begin work on a vaccine. But Avery isn't so sure. He'd found Pfeiffer's, but not consistently. In hmm. fact, he wonders if something else is responsible. A virus too small to see. If so, they could only hope that when they produced a vaccine, the horse would make antibodies for this virus as well. It was the best they could do. After making his report, Welch boards a train to DC. It had been a period of exhausting, dangerous work. He feels bone tired mm -hmm. and has a headache. The symptoms start to show oh, on the no. train ride. He switches his ticket no. and gets a room at his favorite hotel in Atlantic City. He'll remain there, delirious in self-imposed quarantine for weeks. The most respected man in American medicine is out of action, right when the country needs him most, because America was about to run out of coffins. And like I said, just tremendous respect for people like that who put themselves in that situation intentionally to try and help other people, people they've never met. So uh, a lot of respect for any of you out there who are in our medical profession. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for the long hours that you've been putting in, for the tireless efforts, for the just incredible emotional and physical strain that you have been under for the last two years as you've been fighting this. Uh, we are grateful for what you do. Uh, as I mentioned before, and as I always mention, uh, please use the comment section below and let me know something you learned in this episode you didn't know before, or share something uh, concerning what we just talked about that maybe wasn't mentioned that you could add to the conversation. In just a second, you're going to see pop up uh, the information saying thank you to the patrons, and then right after that uh, will be the link uh, in the description or the link on the screen uh, for you to be able to check out the Gettysburg series. It'll take you right to the first episode, which is the story of the Iron Brigade. So please check that out. I'd encourage you uh, to do that. It's a great way to whet your appetite for the on-site stuff. Uh, but until you can see uh, what's coming from France uh, in the next couple of weeks. Thanks for watching.